Councillor Old, Forest Hill Senior District Council, and Widdin and others. Yes, good morning, Mr. Uh, Old and Mr. Well. Can I thank you, first of all, for um, starting a bit early? Um, one of us has got a meeting around about lunchtime, so we don't have to rise about 12.30, but we hope we'll be able to start again about five past two. So we're very grateful for that. Lady, I'm grateful. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Mr. Old. Well, as, as your Lordship said, this is a, an appeal against uh, the order of His Honour Judge Jarman sitting as a judge of the High Court on the 25th of June 2021, in which he dismissed three allegations of contempt against the appellant, but found two other allegations proved and made a committal order suspended on terms. And by the order of Lord Justice Bean, made on the 11th of August 2021, this hearing was ordered to be expedited. Uh, Lords, the, there are four grounds of appeal that relate to the substantive issue of, of contempt and two, uh, two others that relate to sentence. It, it's probably convenient to take them in pairs, so one and two together, three and four together, and then the two sentence grounds together. Although I would say that as far as the substantive grounds are concerned, the, the division is somewhat artificial. There is a, a, a substantial overlap between the, between the grounds. Um, well, also before I start, perhaps I can just do two things of housekeeping. My learned friend wanted to check that your Lordships had received the respondent's bundle, which came in yes. relatively recently. Which contains a single document, of, which, uh, which is the notice of appeal against the original yeah. injunction. I, I, indeed, my Lord. Yep. Yes, Thank you. Um, and, well, Lords, I, I hope you'll allow me a shorthand because the, the strict position is that the um, claimant, uh, in, the, in the matters where they failed, failed to prove the point beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, but I hope you'll allow me the shorthand for this morning, simply say that um, where they failed to prove that uh, the appellant was able to do something, if I say he wasn't able to do something, I'm using it as a shorthand to, to say the long form of saying it was not proved beyond reasonable doubt that he was able to do it. When, when the distinction becomes important, obviously, I, I, I'll make it. Uh, before turning to the grounds in more detail, I'd like to make one uh, preliminary point, uh, which overarches all contempt matters in, in my submission. Because whilst criminal courts routinely deal with imprisonment, under the civil procedure <coughs> rules, committal to prison is, of course, exceptional. And accordingly, to safeguard the position of a person at risk of imprisonment, the courts have traditionally applied uh, the appropriate rules very strictly. Uh, and there are many examples of this, but there's one uh, in the bundle of authorities which il illustrates it very clearly, and that's the case of Hewlett, Packard and Sage, reported in the first volume of the Weekly Law Reports for 2017 at page 459. And, um, Lord, it's um, uh, tab five of the uh, um, authorities comment. Um, well, the facts are moderately complicated, but for, for current purposes, I think I can summarise them like this. Uh, Mr. Sage had given his, um, his fiancée an engagement ring which was worth over £20,000. Uh, sometime later, his home was subject to a search order and he to a freezing order, and the search order, amongst other things, required him to deliver up any jewellery located on the premises, i.e. at his home, exceeding a thousand pounds in value and the concomitant usual order to give uh, information on affidavit as to the location of any jewelry within the scope of the order the, the judge was at, the, the ring was actually at the Sa at mr sage's home as the judge found but mr sage did not disclose it and the judge found that mr sage was in contempt for failing to deliver up the ring during the search and for failing to give information about it However, the grounds of committal were framed in a different way. The grounds of committal were framed on the basis that the ring was in Mr. Sage's possession, power of, and control, whereas in fact the judge had found that it was in the possession, power and control of his fiancée. Uh, and then if I can just pick up the judgment of Lord Justice Henderson at, pay, at paragraph 33 on page 4606 of the report. Uh, Lord Justice Henderson says, it can be seen that none of the provisions of the freezing order and the search order of which Mr. Sage was alleged to be in breach in the amended grounds of, grounds, those are grounds of committal is included in the list of relevant provisions in paragraph 27 of the judgment. Yet it is the latter provisions alone which the judge found Mr. Sage to have breached and which are reflected in the relevant part of the committal order. 
Furthermore, the breaches actually alleged in the amending grounds were clearly unsustainable on the basis of the judge's findings of fact, because they were all predicated on the ring being in the ownership, possession, power, or control of Mr. Sage. Follows that Mr. Sage was not guilty of the breaches relating to the ring with which he was charged. Then this paragraph in particular, 34, this objection cannot, in my opinion, be dismissed as a mere technicality. On the contrary, committal proceedings based on alleged disobedience to court orders are of a quasi-criminal nature, and it is of cardinal importance that the alleged contemnor should have full notice of the charges which he has to face and should not be at risk of being found guilty on any other grounds which have, he has not been charged. Uh, and then, simply to, to follow it over, if one goes over to page the next page, to paragraph 37, um, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Hewlett-Packard sought to amend, and Lord Justice Henderson said when he made, well, Lord Justice Henderson refused permission to amend, but said, when he made his oral submissions to us, leading counsel for Hewlett-Packard accepted that there had been a procedural irregularity, but submitted it was purely technical and had caused their injustice to Mr. Sage. He argued that Mr. Sage clearly understood the terms of the search order, which explained to him by the supervising solicitor, and he must have realized that the ring had to be delivered up, because he falsely informed Mr. Herzog, the solicitor, that the ring did not exist, and he did not correct the position in his affidavit of assets sworn on the 8th of December. Furthermore, after the falsity of his first version of this being exposed, Mr. Sage then concocted equally false second and third versions of what had happened in relation to the ring. The judge had heard all the evidence, said Mr. Petto, and on the basis of his careful findings of fact, there could be no real doubt that Mr. Sage was guilty of breaching the provisions of the search order referred to by the judge. Um, but despite that, Lord Justice Henderson said that, uh, that they, there would be no amendment. Uh, and, and in my submission, the ratio of these cases appears to be either that a failure to comply strictly with the procedure is <coughs> deemed without more to be prejudicial to the defendant, or if that's too wide, if there has been a failure to comply, the court will need not a lot of uh, persuasion to satisfy it that the defendant has in fact uh, suffered prejudice. So, my lords, with that as the starting point, I now turn to the grounds one and two. And the starting point for those grounds is uh, the case of Ray L.W., um, uh, Enforcement and Committal, which is reported in the first volume of the Family Law Reports for 2011, and is tab two in the uh, Bundle of Authorities. Uh, my lords, the facts of this case I don't think are of particular relevance as far as this is concerned, and so I, I go straight to what Lord Justice Mumby, sitting in this court, said uh, about injunctions, and in particular mandatory injunctions, and so I pick it up, if I may, at paragraph 33 on page 1104, where Lord Justice Mumby said, the only other authority I need to refer to at this stage is the decision of this court in Ray S.C. Contempt, where Lord Justice Wall said this, and then a uh, first sentence I don't think matters, but the second one starting contempt will not be established. Contempt will not be established where the breaches of an order which is ambiguous, or which does not require or forbid the performance of a particular act within a specified time frame. The person or persons affected must know with complete precision what it is that they are required to do or to abstain from doing, and then he gives authority for that, the last of which is Harris and Harris, to which I'll come in due course. In Harris, I had referred to the decision of this court in Deodat as authority for the proposition that it is impossible to read implied terms into an injunction. And then at paragraph 34, he says, what I derive from these authorities are the following further propositions. Firstly, the, task, the first task of the judge hearing an application for committal for alleged breach of a mandatory positive order is to identify by reference to the express language of the order precisely what it is that the order required the defendant to do. That is a question of construction and thus a question of law. The next task of the judge is to determine whether the defendant has done what he was required to do, and if he has not, whether it was within his power to do it. To adopt Lord Justice Hughes' language, could he do it, was he able to do it? These are questions of fact. Three, the burden of proof lies throughout on the applicant 
It is for the applicant to establish that it was within the power of the defendant to do the order required, not for the defendant to establish that it was not within his power to do it. And four, the standard of proof is the criminal standard, so that before finding the defendant guilty of contempt, a judge must be sure, A, that the defendant had not done what he was required to do, and B, that it was within the power of the defendant to do it. And I, I did think paragraph five did concern us at this stage. So in summary, with a mandatory order, before contempt can be found, three matters are essential. What does the order mean? Has the appellant failed to do what he's required to do? And thirdly, and what is significant in this appeal, was it within his power to do it? Because contempt is essentially, in this essence, um, defiance of an order of the court. And you're not defying the court if you're not able to do that which you've been ordered to do. And so as a result, an allegation merely of failure to comply with a mandatory order would not constitute a sustainable allegation of contempt because the vital element of whether it was within the defendant's power it is missing. So, Lords, with that as a, as a starting point, can we now go to the application notice uh, in this matter, which is at page uh, C35 in the core bundle. Uh, sorry, sorry, C65 in the core bundle. It, it starts earlier um, at page C60, but the key point is at 12... It says, summary of facts alleged to constitute the contempt, set these out very briefly in chronological order in number of points. Now, that wording comes directly from the new CPR 8142H. It's a requirement. It, the application order must contain uh, the facts alleged to constitute the contempt. But it then refers to the separate document, the particulars of contempt, which starts at page 69, but the relevant page is page 74. And this says the defendant is in breach and has disobeyed paragraphs 1 to 5 of the original 2018 order. And then it says in the premises the defendant is in contempt of court in that he did not. And then it just sets out each of the paragraphs. So it says he did not, but there is absolutely no allegation that the defendant, uh, the appellant here, had the power to carry out either the whole order or indeed any discrete part of that order. And the respondent's evidence does not address that point. So that is entirely missing from the uh, documentation put before the court. Uh, and it's clear from the uh, position in, in Ocado and Reed, uh, which we can go to if your lordships wish, but it, it, they made it clear that it's, it's sufficient to put a succinct summary in the application notice provided the rest is put in the <coughs> witness statement. But here, there is no um, nothing in the application notice and uh, nothing in the witness statements uh, to show that the appellant was able to do any part of those things which are set out in, in the application notice. That, that's slightly surprising because the respondents knew that the appellant had raised that as issues at the original 2018 hearing. Yes, but he'd lost on it. I, I'm sorry, well, He'd lost on it. He, he'd lost on it on the balance of probabilities. Yes. But of course now it's reversed. So they need to prove beyond reasonable doubt that he can. He, in order to prevent an injunction being granted in 2018, the appellant would have had to have shown on the balance of probabilities that he was unable to do the work. Yep. And the, the, the learned judge didn't accept that. But of course, when it comes to committal, it's the complete reverse. It's then for the respondents to prove beyond reasonable doubt that he could. And they must have been aware of that because of the way that he set it up in, in 2018. Yep. Uh, now, the Appellants, uh, the, the respondents could have sought to amend to make uh, good what was missing from the application notice and, and the uh, the evidence, but they haven't. So doesn't done every so. allegation of contempt of court 
necessarily involve an allegation that it was within the power of the person to do it. Not every allegation. No. Otherwise, it's not a contempt of court. Well, no, the Lord, you've it, just said with 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 a um, a, a negative order, it's sufficient that they didn't do it. Uh, sorry, it's sufficient that they, they did do it. Yes. But with a positive order, it's an element of that you have to show that they oh, were yes. able to do it. That's, yes, that's I should have difference. confined my observation then to mandatory injunctions. But it is necessarily in, present in an allegation of contempt that the person who has not complied with a mandatory order could have done so had he chosen. Otherwise, um, it's not contempt. But Lord, I'm not sure I fully follow the point your Lordship's making to me. It, it isn't in my submission sufficient to make out an allegation of a breach of a mandatory order simply to say you haven't done it. There must be some allegation or some evidence that oh, shows... Well, you need to be careful between allegation. Are you making a pleading point or a sufficiency of evidence point? Uh, well, both in this case. Right. Well, I'm just at the moment on the pleading point. Yes. So we don't need to think about evidence. Uh, it, it says in the application that the defendant is in contempt of court because he's failed to comply with a mandatory order. Uh, unless he could have done, it would not be a contempt of court. Uh, yes, but, my Lord, that's a, a necessary element of the allegation. Is there any authority for that proposition? Uh, well, the one that I just took your lordship to, which is Ray L.W. No, that says that the judge has got to be satisfied of it. It doesn't say it's got to be in the application notice as a separate allegation. Well, does it? My lord, in order to put a defendant on notice of what you're going to be saying when you get to the hearing, and that's part of the problem, which I'll come to in due course, that he was taken by surprise, that it, you need to set out not just that you haven't done it, but why you say you could do it because that is a, a necessary part. And simply to, to, to leave it hanging there as by implication it, it, in my submission is, is not good enough because the defendant is entitled to know what's being alleged against him and what he's got to come out to meet. And he shouldn't then be left looking at the application notice and going, well, what, what could I do? Uh, it should be set out, you could have done this. And, and that's entirely missing. Uh, Lord, we will come to it in a minute, but uh, one bears in mind, for example, Lord Upjohn's comment in Morris and Redden Briggs, which is, it's not sufficient that the order in law works. The defendant needs to know, in fact, what he is to do or not to do. And therefore, I, I suppose, in exceptional cases, there may be some occasions where it's, it's acceptable, it's so obvious that the the defendant could do it, but here, where the appellant had specifically majored on the point when the injunction was being granted, and when he then come back to the court by email and said, I can't do it, what should I do? Um, it is in my submission not good enough simply to not to set out um, in, in the application that which he uh, should have done. So what you're submitting is that the application notice was bad in law and should have been struck out. Uh, the law that the, 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 the application notice doesn't set out arguable grounds for committal. That's the primary. Was that submission made to the judge? Uh, the law that certainly it was intended to be made to the judge. I can't now remember in detail what I said to the judge on that particular point. Because he um, hasn't, I think, ruled on it. He hasn't specifically ruled on it. Uh, but the, the whole point I was making to the judge was there was no evidence that this was, a, and it wasn't alleged against him. That's my yes. recollection. I'm just on the pleading point. Yes. Not about sufficiency of evidence. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I have the, that. The, the, the difficulty is with these, of course, it's quite difficult to separate the two, but I, I take your Lordship's point. Yes. Um, um, what Melodo Friend does, as far as I can see, looking at his, his skeleton argument, is to say, well, the judge was entitled to take into account the evidence from the affidavit from the appellant. And that's clearly right. It was clearly evidence that was there. But firstly, that evidence doesn't actually cure the defect that I've just identified. But secondly, all the appellant's evidence showed was that the appellant had some money. It doesn't show the likely cost 
of carrying out the items which he was said to have failed to have done uh, uh, contumeliously. And it's essential, of course, it's the total cost that he's able to cover, because the judge wasn't penny-picking out one and saying, well, you could have done the, removed the debt, and you clearly have enough money for that. You can do this, you can do that. It was a smaller group of things, but they were all together that he was in contempt, and it wasn't separated off. And so if soft stripping and decommissioning really mean what is now set out in the schedule to the committal order, the 2021 committal order, there would clearly be a substantial cost. And without evidence of what that cost is likely to be, the court can never be sure that the appellant is able to carry out the terms of the order. Because clearly he can't do it by himself. This is not something where he can personally do it. He has to employ others. So the court must be satisfied on the criminal standard that the defendant is able to pay for that work. And there was simply no evidence uh, of that uh, which, upon which the, the judge could rely. Um, what the learned friend then goes on and says is, well, the, the learned judge had a sight view, and he saw the decking and things like that. Um, now, as I say, that doesn't get round the point uh, that uh, he only saw bits of it. But first of all, what the judge saw on the sight view cannot have been evidence two and a half years later in a committal application. Uh, if the judge was going to rely on matters he saw on the sight view, in my submission, he should have put the appellant on notice that that was what he was going to do, so the appellant had an opportunity to deal with it. But far more importantly, it would be sheer speculation of a judge to go around and think, oh, well, it's going to cost less than X pounds, uh, and therefore I'm satisfied so that I'm sure that the uh, defendant is able to do that work. Well, also the, the next point that the learned friend seems to make is that it says that the appellant can have been in no doubt as to the case he had to meet, and therefore there really is no prejudice to him. Now, I go back to the point I made right at the beginning, that um, procedural irregularity is probably sufficient in itself, but if I'm wrong about that, it's simply not correct to say that the appellant uh, knew the case he had to meet. The appellant came to, to meet a case that he'd failed to demolish the building. And he candidly accepted that he hadn't done so. And the whole of his affidavit addressed that issue. Uh, for example, the cost of demolition is agreed to be about three quarters of a million pounds. And his affidavit was designed specifically, uh, amongst other things, to show that he'd had nothing like uh, that um, a, a amount of money. So when the learned friend says in paragraph or three of his skeleton argument that um, the um, Mr. Wilden's own affidavit sworn for the purpose of the legal application hearing contradicts the case he now seeks to advance. He did not assert any imprecision in the injunction order or any difficulty understanding it or any absence of any particular allegation. On the contrary, candidly accepted non-compliance and simply advanced various reasons, some of which the judge has accepted, as to why he could not comply with certain requirements, not an issue in this appeal. Precisely because Mr. Weldon did not recognize that his affidavit should deal with these other matters. He was taken by surprise. His affidavit was addressed solely to the question of, can I uh, knock the whole building down? Because it had never been put to him, if you can't knock the whole building down, then you have a duty to do the best you can in the circumstances uh, with other matters. If the respondent's case had been set out in the alternative, firstly, that the appellant was in breach for failing to demolish the buildings, but if it were to be the case the appellant was not capable of demolishing the building, he would still be in contempt because he'd failed to do uh, as much as he was able to do the appellant's affidavit would have been very different. And I can give just a couple of examples. Firstly, the learned judge referred to his drawings 
But of course, they're gross and they're taxed. But there was no putting into tax and things of that sort, nor does it set out his liabilities. Because all that was necessary for the affidavit was to show beyond peradventure that he did not have the wherewithal to demolish the building at the £750,000 agreement. And as I said to the learned judge, and he did record, that was not the case. The case that uh, the appellant was found in contempt of was not the case that he came to meet. And it wasn't, it wasn't the case he came to meet because this alternative case was entirely missing either from the particulars of contempt or from the respondent's evidence. Now, I appreciate the particulars of contempt set out the individual points from the order, but they don't say they can be done individually. And so when the learned friend says in his skeleton argument there was nothing in uh, Mr. Wilden's affidavit to the effect that he was unable to carry out the four temporary steps, leaving aside that that, of course, reverses <coughs> the burden of proof. It wasn't for Mr. Wilden to show that, but for the uh, applicants to show it. Um, the reason there was nothing about the four temporary steps was it wasn't anticipated that that was the case that would have to be met. Additionally, there is no evidence that the items that Mr. Wilden is said to be in breach of are able to be done separately. Now, no doubt some of them can. But to give just one example, it's necessary to construct a temporary stone road in order to have access. In order to do that, it's necessary to demolish the upper half of the boundary wall. Now, just to explain, my lords, this is not the top section of bricks, it's the top section of the wall. Uh, one, one can see that if one goes to C119, which is a slightly complicated plan, but if I don't know whether your lordships can see from where I'm standing, but this is the building. This is the neighbouring building belonging to the appellant's children. And the wall runs along there to the road. And this section of the wall will have to be removed. So it's that top section. So the whole of the wall down to the ground will have to be removed. It, it, it's ambiguous in the report. It says the top section. But it doesn't mean just the top of the bricks to be able to get something over them. It means taking that out. Now, the point of doing that is in order to be able to create the road up there to get the equipment in. And since the learned judge accepted that the appellant couldn't do that because he wasn't the sole owner of the wall, in the same way, to go on and then say, but yes, he could then do things that would require it uh, to be removed, such as create the road, which is the second item, it is not consistent. Do we have any documents about the title to 24 Meanhurst Road? Um, my Lord, the, the position about 24 was that at the hearing before um, Judge Jarman in, in 2018, it was held as tenants in common by uh, the, um, uh, the appellant and his children and a company called Espresso. Um, in, a, in a shares, 80%, I think, came 20% to them. And, and they actually put in a witness statement saying they were not to allow the wall to be demolished. Um, after that, at threat of the mortgagee's repossession, um, that property has now been transferred to the children. Yes, I, I asked whether we have any documents about the title. Um, I've read the evidence about it, but I, 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 I don't see it substantiated. Can I come back to that? Yes, later, please. My Lord? I, I'm, there is one document in the bundle in the bank. But I haven't flagged it, so... Okay, thank you. Uh, so. You can come back to it, certainly. Um, uh, just, just following up on that, Mr. Oldbees, if I may, um, wh what was the position about the ownership of that house before the 2018 hearing? I mean, is it, had, it, had it always been held in those shares, or was there a point when the appellant owned it? My, lady, my recollection is that it had been in those shares for some years, four or five years, and that before that, 
it had been in the sole ownership of the appellant. Because the bulk of the building is built in the garden of 24, with a little bit of it coming into 24A, which is Altea. I'm sorry, my lady, it's terribly complex. Yeah, so sorry. Um, so which is the house that the appellant does own? Um, is that 24 or 24A? Um, my lady, today he, he doesn't, but 24A was his home. Right, 24A was his home. Uh, 24 is Altea. Facing from the road, my lady, Altea is on the right, 24 is on the left. 24 is confusingly also called the bungalow at times. Right. And he, he doesn't own Altea anymore? My lord, no. There was a. Altea was subject to a Northern <coughs> Rock mortgage, and then NRAM took it on when Northern Rock collapsed. It was a fixed term mortgage which came to an end in about 2017, um, and therefore the whole capital was repayable. And in order to prevent uh, the mortgagee taking possession, and they were threatening possession proceedings and solicitors had started uh, on that line, um, it was sold to uh, Expressa, I think the Lord is now the owner. But, my lord, I, I, don't, I don't argue that at this stage because it, I think one needs to take the position <laughs> as at the hearing of the original injunction proceedings. Um, as, as but Expressa is a company that's partly owned by the appellant? Uh, no, my lady, I think it's totally under the control of his children. Right. Under the control? Um, uh, your, my, my lady asked about ownership. Um, my understanding is that the, the total share capital is, is owned by the children. I, I can check that, my lord, I may be wrong. but that's The reason opinion. I was querying control is because, because the letter has Mr. Wilde in as director um, recently. My lord, I, I can take instructions on that. Um, do you want me to do so now, or is it? Uh, yes, I, I think that would be helpful. It's, it's a letter that is in the big bundle. My instructions are Mr. Wilden has not been a, a director since something like the 1980s. Who is who? I see. So I'm, I must have misread the, the, that then. My lord, of course, his son is there, so there is a Wilden. Well, there are three. But it's not. Um, but it's not his. Page S480. And there are three Wildens. First is, the first two are his daughters, and the last is his son. Right. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Oak, can I just go back to something you said earlier? You were explaining that I think that the, the building was the subject of the injunction, the contempt proceedings. Is, is partly in the ground of grounds of 24A and partly in the grounds of 24? Is that what, what you said? My lady, it's, it's all on its own land now, but as originally built, the vast bulk of it was in uh, the ground of 24, the bungalow, but there was a very small extension of it that fell into land of Altea, uh, and that was transferred to it. So it's all now a single title, um, which is GR if your, your ladyship wants the title number. Yeah? Uh, it's GR 140446 is, is the, the land that the building is on. And just for the sake of completeness. So is that a separate title from It's Althea? a separate title, my lady. So looking at it from the road, the one on the left, the bungalow 24, 
is GR406481. Then again, looking at it from the road on the right-hand side is Altea, which is also 24A Meanhurst Road, <coughs> which is GR250043. And the building, which lies mainly behind 24, uh, is GR140446. Right. And so who, who, who now owns each of those parcels of land? Um, lady, the GR140446 is uh, owned by the appellant. Right. Uh, GR250043 Uh, is owned by Expressa Limited. Yeah. And GR406481 is held uh, as tenants in common by Expressa and the um, appellant's children. I've got to the position of saying that the, um, there's no evidence that these uh, the things that the uh, appellant was found as being contempt for not doing uh, could be done separately. And I was making the point <coughs> that one of them is that he didn't put in a stone road. And in order to put in a stone road, uh, he would need to remove the wall. When it was accepted, that can't be done because he doesn't have uh, ownership and entire ownership. Of that. And so, on analysis of the evidence, there is simply no evidence before the court that it is possible to do the item separately from total dem demolition and or the cost of doing them separately from total demolition. And in my submission, it's not for the court to speculate what that evidence might show. And so, even on the balance of probability, the court could not say that the appellant was able to carry out the items in respect of which he was found to be in contempt. And with the greatest respect to the judge, if he had followed what Lord Justice Henderson had said and set out removing these items, what is the evidence that these items can be removed? Well, there's evidence that Mr. Wilden has money, but there's absolutely no evidence of the cost of doing and there's absolutely no evidence that it can be done separately. He would, in my submission, have come to the conclusion that he could not be sure that they were doable, and if they were not doable, then the uh, appellant cannot be in contempt. My Lord, so that's all I propose to say about grounds one and two. Perhaps I can move on to ground three and four. And the starting point for that, if I may, is the selective anthology, as the then Mr. Justice Mumby called it, in Harrison Harris, uh, at paragraph starting at paragraph 288. So that's the first tab uh, in the, uh, the authorities bundle. And again, I, I haven't put in all the facts. It's a story of divorce and access to children. But Mr. Justice Mumby then went on, and Harris is reported in the second volume of the family law reports for 2001, starting at uh, paragraph 288, where Mr. Justice Mumby says, it's an elementary principle of justice and fairness that no order will be enforced by committal unless it is expressed in clear certain and unambiguous language. So far as this is possible, the person affected should know with complete precision what, he is, what it is that he is required to do or to abstain from doing. 
The authorities setting out this, some, this sometimes overlooked principle are legion. A no doubt selective anthology would include, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but if I can highlight three. The Attorney General and Staffordshire County Council in 1905, where Mr. Justice Joyce said, an injunction should be certain and definite in its terms, and it must or ought to be quite clear what the person against whom the injunction is made is required to do or refrain from doing. Then skipping one and going to the Iberian Trust case, where Mr. Justice Luxmore said, uh, the order must define the precise steps which are to be taken, and must in unambiguous terms direct what is to be done. And then the third is the uh, Redland Bricks and Morris matter, to which I've already referred, my Lord, where Lord Upjohn said, the order must be such that the defendant knows exactly, in fact, what he has to do. And this means not as a matter of law, but as a matter of fact. And then going over the page, uh, Mr. Justice Mumbley it follows, um, it, follow, it follows, as was reported by the Court of Appeal in Deodat, that it's impossible to read implied terms into an injunction. And he says, a related principle is that the order should not require the person to whom it is addressed to cross-refer to other material in order to ascertain his precise obligation. Uh, and then he quotes from Elliman Reed and uh, Elliman Lines and Reed, and then uh, further down to the Ray Rudkin Jones, a bankrupt ex parte, the bankrupt, the trustee, the property, the bankrupt. In fact, the Lords, the reference is wrong. The 1964 application was a previous application, and the correct application is in the Solicitor's Journal. Um, written around. Again, I'll give that to you later if I may. It's, it's just um, the, the quotation is exactly correct. Um, the order was as drawn, read, it is ordered that the injunction be granted in the terms of the notice of motion for injunction. Lord Upjohn said, I do want to protest as strongly as I can at the granting of injunctions in that form. It means then that the person against whom the injunction is granted has to look at another document in order to see what it is that he is enjoined from doing. It cannot be too clearly understood that a person is entitled to look and look only at the order to see what it is that he is enjoined from doing. He looks at that order and he finds out from the four walls of it and from no other document exactly what it is that he must not do. Then going over the page, if I may, to... So, so, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Old. Was this point made to the judge at um, the hearing? Milady, I don't think it was in these terms, no. Um, because um, the, the, the debate I had with the judge was that the, um, uh, the O'Brien and Price report had not been attached to the order and had not been, si had not been served with the order. Uh, and that therefore it wasn't enforceable, but I didn't take him to Harris at the Right, so sorry, I'm just trying to get a note of what you're saying, so could you just slow down, please? I'm sorry. So the debate you had with the judge was whether... Whether there could be reliance on the O'Brien and Price report, because it yeah. had not been uh, annexed to the order, the 2018 order, yeah. nor had it been served with it when the order had been served. And the view that the learned judge took was that it was uh, clearly incorporated by reference, because it is expressly referred to, and that that was sufficient. All right. And you didn't refer him to these authorities? I didn't refer him to Harris at that time, because, my lady of the county, I hadn't found Harris at that time. Right. Um, so I referred to him the the principle that she then rejected. So you, you didn't submit to the judge um, when, when the order was made, um, oh look, this order refers in, uh, um, purports to incorporate by reference this report, and it, and it shouldn't. That's not fair, because my client shouldn't have to look at the report to know what he's got to do. Um, the lady, I didn't go as far as the second part, but I did make is take issue that it had not been uh, formed part of the original order, and indeed the learning judge records that, um, and says that I then accepted that it was incorporated. And of course, as a matter of straight construction, it is incorporated because it's expressly referred to. Can you just remind me which bit of the judgment that which paragraph? You don't need to take me to it now, but which paragraph of the judgment is that? 
Uh, yes, it's um, uh, paragraph uh, 10 and 11. Thank you. I think I was in paragraph 292 of Harris, where um, Mr. Justice Mumbry says, this in my judgment is a wholly unacceptable state of affairs. It's intolerable that a layman who risks imprisonment should be left to disentangle a series of orders so complicated that, as I pointed out, even the legally qualified draftsman has slipped up in his understandings of jigsaw. As Lord Upjohn emphasized in the passage in his judgment in Ray Rankin Jones, quoted above, an injunction should, set out, should be set out complete in a single document, that so that looking only at that one document, the party enjoined can see exactly what it is he must not do. And then the start of paragraph 294, minimum standards of proper practice mean that Mr. Harris ought to have been able to see the terms of the injunction originally granted by his honour Judge Cottrell by looking at one document rather than the six, which he was in fact compelled to study. <coughs> My Lord. <coughs> What I want to do now is to look at the construction of the 2018 order, which is, of course, the first step in dealing with uh, what Mr. Um, Wilder was, was required, not, uh, required to do. Uh, and in my submission, the uh, 2018 order, like any document of that sort, needs to be construed as a whole. Now, on carrying out that exercise, it becomes clear that paragraph one of the order Lords, it's on page C40. Paragraph 1 is the order, it's the main operative part. And paragraphs 2 to 5 are ancillary to it. So paragraph 1 says, comply with the enforcement notice, knock down the building. And paragraphs 2 to 5 are essentially a method in which that uh, is to be brought about. And indeed, paragraph 2 makes it expressly clear, because it says the claimant will, will provide a signed copy of a contract for the works uh, in, required in paragraphs one, little one and little two above. So they're clearly linked there. Now, I, I, I make a point that I made below, and I know my learned friend objects to, but nonetheless I, I, I make it. And that is that the form of the order is clearly incorrectly drafted, because it doesn't reflect the judgment <coughs> of uh, Judge Jarman. And that is because Judge Jarman allowed 18 months to do this work. And actually, uh, if you add up the periods of time uh, between paragraphs 2 and 5, it only amounts to seven and a half months. If, however, you add up the paragraphs sequentially, it comes to 18 months. So paragraph 3, in my submission, should have been drafted no later than 16 weeks from carrying out what was required in paragraph 2. Paragraph 4 should have said 18 weeks after that. And paragraph 5, 32 weeks after that. And that would then give you the 18 months. If the order had been drafted in that form, it would be immediately apparent that those paragraphs are subsidiary to the first paragraph and do not stand alone. But even if that were not the case, it's quite clear that paragraphs 3 to 5 are not freestanding. A lot of the, the paragraph 3 requires compliance with items in the recommended method statement, and those were to be reinstated after <coughs> demolition. So there would be no point in doing those if demolition was not to follow. So removing the um, decking and the, uh, the summer house and things like that were only necessary to give access 
for demolition purposes. They were clearly ancillary to demolition and were not an end in themselves. Soft stripping, whatever that might mean, and I'll come to that in a moment, is clearly not an end in itself, uh, but merely a step in the demolition process. And so what's set out in paragraphs three to five are not uh, freestanding matters to be done come what may. They are the means by which the demolition of the building required in paragraph one will take. And once it's accepted that the appellant can't demolish the building, the requirement to comply with the other matters falls away. Perhaps it can be tested in this way. Supposing the appellant found a, a demolition contractor who said, look, I don't need to do any of this stuff. I, I'm an expert with explosive demolitions. I can use little small explosives and I can bring the building down. I just walk in there, I'll bring it down little by little into the middle I don't need to bother with soft stripping. I don't need to bother with putting in a road. I don't need to knock down the wall. I can just bring the building down. So the building is demolished, but without any compliance with paragraphs three to five. If they're freestanding, the appellant would still be in contempt for failing to comply with paragraphs three to five, notwithstanding he complied with the major point in knocking the building down. Uh, and in my submission, that makes it clear that the point of the order was to knock down the building and that paragraphs three to five on a true construction are simply ancillary to that and do not stand alone such that the uh, appellant cannot, as a matter of law, be in contempt for failing to comply with them. But, of course, what the 2018 order means as a matter of law is not the overriding factor. As Lord Upjohn said in Redland, Bricks and Morris, the, the point is, what did it mean in fact? And did the appellant understand what it meant in fact? Now, the 2018 order simply fails to address what the appellant should do if he is unable to comply with paragraph one of the order, or paragraph two of the order, which the learned judge found, or indeed a part of the O'Brien and Price report. Now, the appellant wasn't, at this stage, a litigant in person. And what he did was he emailed the court. And he said to the court, I cannot comply. What do I do? I want a hearing. And he was told that uh, there wouldn't be a hearing. Now, in my submission, a person cannot be in contempt when it's unclear what he should do in the circumstances that has arisen. And then to cherry pick out certain bits and say, well, you couldn't do the whole, but you could have done that, and you could have done that, is grossly unfair. So, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Rob. Can you just remind us what page in the bundle the email is, please? Um, Yes, maybe there at, um, uh, there at S136 and then 135 because they're um, emails, so they come backwards. Response of the court is not in the, the hearing bundle, but I do have a copy of that if, if the court wants it. Yeah. Um, the, to find the appellant guilty of contempt of the subsidiary issues in my submission, is effectively to imply a term into the order that if he's 
unable to demolish the whole building, then a secondary duty arises, which is that he should use his best endeavours to do to carry out as much as his uh, as he's able and his finances permit. But as has been made quite clear, you cannot imply terms into an injunction order. Now, my lords, the next weakness with the order is the one that we've already touched on, is the fact that the O'Brien and Price report um, was uh, incorporated simply by reference. And the fact that it's now been possible to set out in the committal order exactly what is meant by soft stripping and decommissioning makes it quite clear it could have been done back in 2018. And it was unacceptable simply incorporating the Ed Brown and Price report. But there's another problem with the Ed Brown and Price report, and it's this. It wasn't a clear, definitive report. It was a preliminary discussion document subject to later detailed design. And, and that is made clear on the face of the document at page C95 at the beginning of paragraph 2.4. This is the recommended method statement. And it says, subject to verification by detailed design and input from selected contractors. And indeed, the plans attached to it are similarly uh, caveat. So this was a discussion document. It wasn't a final um, document. And therefore, there are no definitions, for example, of exactly what is meant by the upper half of the boundary wall. Or there's a reference to putting in a stone <coughs> blanket, which is to be geo-grid anchored to a floor. Now, no doubt those terms can be made certain by consulting appropriately qualified professionals. But that cannot be the basis of the committal order. It must set out exactly what the um, uh, appellate is supposed to do in terms that are understandable to him. Your lordships have that I object to the term soft stripping, because I say that soft stripping is a jargon word from the demolition trade. And even now I notice that my learned friend hasn't attempted any definition of it. Indeed, if the several of us who sit at this side of the bar were to write down what we understood by the expression soft stripping, whilst I suspect there would be some overlap <coughs> at the margins, there would be some grave differences. And without a definition, it's impossible to know what is included uh, or what is not included. So Learned Friend takes the point that, that the appellant mentions soft stripping in his affidavit, but that takes the matter no further forward because it's quite clear that he's using it in a completely different form from that which is used, for example, in the schedule to the committal order. Semantically, soft stripping clearly indicates there must be some other kind of building stripping which one must think of as hard stripping. And therefore, when one looks at the committal order, what is set out as soft stripping, when you get to removing radiators and air conditioning units and things like that, one might think fell outside what people would normally think of in as much as people normally think of what soft stripping means. The problem is it's just far too imprecise. It was an unacceptable shorthand in a committal order, as were terms such as decommissioning, because decommissioning can be both permanent and temporary, and there was no indication of what was required or what the uh, appellant had to do. And as I say, the point that undermines it at the end is the fact that the learned judge then agreed to this schedule being attached to the committal order, which sets out in great detail what is now meant by decommissioning and what is now meant uh, by soft stripping. Uh, the problem with paragraphs three and four in a practical terms is that the wording is not certain and definite in its terms, so that it's quite clear what the appellant is required to do. Um, Lord, so that's all I propose to say about the second two grounds. There are just a few miscellaneous points which I would, would like to, to pick up, um, mainly arising from a learned friend's skeleton argument. One, he, he makes the point that the appellant sought permission to appeal the 2018 order, and he 
takes the point there was nothing in the permission application to say that the 2018 order was imprecise or that the appellant didn't understand it. And Malenikan therefore argues that this is somehow embarking on an impermissible second attack on the 2018 order. Uh, my lords, in my submission, there are a number of responses to that. But at present, can I just confine myself to one? I'll come back, if I may, if other points arise. There was a delay in finalizing the order following the 2018 hearing. As a result, that order was not finalized until the 12th of December 2018, whereas the application for permission to appeal was filed at this court on the 6th of December. So that the application predates the finalization of the order, and it cannot be appropriate that the appellant or litigative person takes issue on the form of the form of the uh, order in that later in that application. So, so how, does that, how does that work in practice? Did, did the judge, did, when the judge gave judgment, did, did, did he indicate what the terms of the order would be? Uh, Milady, I'm, I'm not sure. I wasn't there, but I think Milady's friend was. I don't know if... Um, I, I can help, my lady. Um, yeah. What is not apparent on the face of the papers is that judgment having been handed down in October 2018 yeah. was then a short hearing in November. Yeah. Different counsel appeared. Um, his name actually appears on the face of the injunction order, Mr. Henderson. We see that at C40, just below the second hole punch. And the terms of the injunction order were settled on that occasion. It, it, it just so happens that the order was sealed on the 12th of December, but there's nothing in that point. The terms were sorted and settled in November, before the application to this court. Right. And what was the date of the November hearing? The 16th, I believe. Right. Yes, 16th. All right. So the order wasn't sealed until the 12th of December, but you say it was finalised at the hearing on the 16th of December. I, I uh, do, 16th my of lady. November, I'm 16th sorry. 16th of November. Yeah. And, and then ab it, it took some time administratively for it to be sealed. All right. Thank you. And, and the appellant was represented by counsel at that November hearing. My lady, no, he was in oh. person on that occasion. Oh, I see, sorry. So he was represented by Mr. Henderson. No, my lady, forgive me if it's my mistake. Mr. Henderson basically substituted for me. Oh, I'm so sorry, I've misread it. Yeah, I see, I've misread it. So on both occasions, the appellant was in person. Correct. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Um, lady, the next brief point I, I seek to make is that um, from time to time in his skeleton argument, a learned friend complains that the appellant never raised a particular argument in his affidavit. Well, the first answer to that is an affidavit, of course, gives evidence. It's not a skeleton argument. But more importantly, this seems to be an attempt by a learned friend to reverse the burden of proof. It's not for the appellant to say what he thought, in fact, he had to do. It's for the respondent to prove that the appellant has failed to comply and has the means to comply. My lords, that also, as is often the case in these matters, there are a, a fair number of peripheral issues. And in my submission, it's unfortunate that the respondent's affidavits contain a significant amount of evidence which appears to have been deployed more to attack the character of the appellant, and which appears to have no relevance on, whether the, on the question of whether the appellant had the ability to comply with the 2018 order or not. Um, I've therefore made no reference to it, uh, because in my submission it is irrelevant. But if the court thinks otherwise, then can I reserve the ability, once my learned friend has made his submissions, to come back on In, my lords, in summary, the position is this. The original
original order incorporated documents without even attaching or uh, serving the O'Brien and Price report, and that was seriously defective. The application missed out anything about the ability of the appellant to do the work, or and especially that he couldn't that he could have done certain parts of the work, and therefore it too was seriously flawed. Thirdly, the technology used in the 2018 order was ambiguous and unclear. In particular, it made no provision for what the appellant should do if he was unable to comply with certain parts of the 2018 order. I say that in those circumstances, it's not necessary for the appellant to show that he suffered any prejudice, but it's clear that he did because he was found in to be in contempt on a basis which was not set out in any of the documentation and which he had not come to the court below to address. My Lords, for those reasons, I say that the appellant's appeal should be allowed. But if your Lordships are against me on that, then I turn to the question of sentence. And I say straight away that I cannot um, object to the period of six weeks imprisonment if the uh, appellant is uh, in, in breach and in contravenous breach in the sense that um, he is defiant in the court, then quite clearly that is a, an, an appropriate uh, sentence. Uh, the point that I make uh, is that the sentence is suspended upon him doing works within an 18-week period. However, there is no evidence that that work is doable within an 18-week period, nor how it were to would be done. And the difficulty is that while some of it is fairly routine and some of it would be very simple, some of it will require, I'm instructed, substantial plant and equipment to carry out. For example, removal of, of radiators. The, I think the learning judge may have thought, and we all may have thought, that radiators were rather like the ones in this court, but actually, apparently, they're high up um, and heavy items, and they need equipment to, re to remove them. And so to restrict it to 18 weeks in my submission, uh, he is not appropriate. Uh, he clearly needs time to go and find a contractor to do it. He then needs to get the contractor to get access. And he needs to be able to apply if it transpires that no contractor can properly do it. Well, hasn't he got that in paragraph 6 of the order? Of the original order? Oh, the original C41. Um, well, Lord, that's the extension of time. It, yes. Um, Does that still work? Well, I'm not sure it would for the committal. The, the, the point being that the, the order of the 20, uh, of, of 2021 yeah. uh, under appeal, um, of course, says that um, he's. Um, Sentenced to six weeks imprisonment, suspended for 12 months on condition he fully complies within 18 weeks of the terms of the attached schedule. And there doesn't appear to be any ability to come back to apply to extend that, no matter how long it might reasonably take to do. And so, what I it, 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 so you say there should have been, um, but if there had been, would that deprive your point of any force? I, I think, my lord, it, it, it would. It, it's. Um, one, one clearly sees that if there is a contempt, then one of the primary roles of, of, the, of the punishment is to get compliance, and therefore the aim is to provide a period in which compliance can properly be made. Yeah. Um, and, and yes, well, that is my submission, essentially, on it. The only other point I make is that the, the suspension of a sentence in a criminal matter, of course, is to put the uh, 
defendant on, on his honor or on his best behavior, um, that he doesn't commit other criminal offenses. But here, the, the only matters of which um, Mr. Wilden has been convicted uh, will have been remedied within the period necessary to, to do it. So there doesn't appear to be any point in suspending the order beyond that. that well, there might be. He might be. I mean, it, we've seen some correspondence about a swimming pool. I don't want to get into all the rights and wrongs of that. But if you were to assume that perhaps um, there's to be development, and it may be arguable as to whether there's going to be a certificate of lawful use or not, uh, and if Mr. Wildin, this Mr. Wildin, were to uh, proceed on the basis of his own understanding of what permitted development was, rather than to proceed with more caution on this occasion and was found yet again to have been in breach of panic control, uh, then the suspended sentence might have an impact in restraining him from behaving in that way so that he was more qu careful about planning control in any future development which he may be behind. Um, the Lord, to activate a suspended sentence for a committal in out of matter A in respect of a completely uh, disconnected would in my submission be unusual because committal is there designed to ensure compliance with orders of the court yes. and with um, the, the particular order with which the court is dealing. Yeah. And your lordship slightly takes me by surprise because I'm, I don't, I'm not aware of any case where a suspended committal has been exercised in respect of um, no, I'm not. another matter. It, it has its attractions, my lord, I can see, but I'm not sure that it necessarily is something that... Well, it's a, it was only an answer to, uh, or suggested answer, to your point that it was futile in, uh, where, and that there was no point in it. Yes. Um, actually, in this case, where there's an ongoing wrangle, potentially, about what is lawful development and what's not in a number of different ways, uh, there, there could be a use. Well, my lord, I'm, I'm in your lordship's hands, so I... I my lords, unless I can assist your lordships further, those are my submissions. Thank you very much, Mr. Oldham. Uh, my lady, my lord, thank you. Um, the court knows I've set out <coughs> quite a lot of the background in my skeleton argument. Um, I wasn't proposing to go through that. I think the court will now be very well versed with the background. But I, can I just... Um, deal with one point that my Lord mentioned about title documents. It, it may not be quite the point my Lord had in mind, but if I just give the court a page reference, it's in the large bundle at page uh, 121. This forms part of the evidence uh, below. Um, it relates, as one can see, alongside the first hole punch to um, land adjoining 24 Meanhurst Road. Um, 24 Meanhurst Road, in other words. And if one looks below the second hole punch, we see the proprietors uh, listed as the Company Expressa Limited about which you've heard a little, uh, and the three children. So that deals with 24 Meanhurst Road. So far as... Um, and that's a transfer which was two days before the hearing at which the terms of the order were settled. Correct. Yep. Um, so far as the property Altea is concerned, a.k.a. 24A, um, my instructing solicitor dealt with that in her affidavit and, if you like, alerts the she'd received which suggested an attempt to sell it. Mr. Wielden in his affidavit describes, if you like, his attempt to sell it and things having fallen through. Suffice it to say that by the time of the hearing below, uh, 
there was no title documentation to support the proposition that Mr. Wielden no longer owned it. Uh, and just in parenthesis, although I'm mindful of, if you like, trespassing the line, I, I, I'm in, on instructions, I'm told that to this day, Altair is registered to Mr. Wielden. And of course, on appeal, I'm, I'm mindful of not, if you like, going too far, but I just wanted to uh, mention those instructions. Sorry, is that Altair? Altair, correct. Well, I think um, we have a, an office copy of the register at 482, the last document in the big bundle, dated the 15th of June 2021, in relation to Altea. Yes, I'm grateful for that. So there is actually evidence, and was... Well, positive evidence to the effect that uh, Mr. Wielden owned it. Yes. And that whatever his attempts might have been, they have not translated into registration in somebody else. So I, I'm grateful for that, my Lord. Th there are one or two other factual matters, but perhaps I'll deal with those uh, as we work our way through the grounds. So, like my friend, I'll take um, the grounds in three pairs. So, the first uh, point really is the uh, asserted lack of evidence of ability to comply with the uh, steps uh, as to which contempt was found. Uh, and I uh, submitted in writing, and I, and I maintain orally, that, that the court uh, is entitled and should uh, have regard to what Mr. Wielden said in his affidavit in terms of what he could not do. Can, can I invite the court to that, please, for a, a, a few short points? It's at page 291 of the large bundle, or it starts at 291. So that's just to um, take you to the first page by way of introduction. If we go over the page, please, to 292, uh, it begins with Mr. Wielden accepting non-compliance, and then, as he explains in his own words, I, I cannot do so, that's to say, uh, comply with the order, for, for four main reasons. So Mr. Wielden then, in the balance of his affidavit, sets out his rationale or his explanation for why he cannot comply. Uh, and quite simply, what follows does not bear on the findings of contempt and the matters on this appeal. The, 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 they, they go through A to D. So A, which I can take this shortly, A is to do with the boundary wall, and the judge found in Mr. Wielden's favour on that point. If we go over the page, about halfway down we see B, and this is a point about demolishing the building and substantial plant being required, and an assertion that access cannot be created without demolishing the wall. Again, this is nothing to do with the findings of content, this is about the boundary wall and demolishing the building. Then C, uh, Mr. Wielden explains that he, he cannot find contractors for the demolition, emphasise demolition, and then the next fourth, it should be D, but it, it, it says A in fact at the foot of the page, uh, Mr. Wielden basically says I cannot raise the three quarters of a million pounds for the demolition. As I say, nothing at all to the effect of I cannot comply with the matters the subject of this appeal. There's then, uh, if you like, some detail in relation to those four points, which I think we can pass over. But, um, importantly, if we go to S304, 
really towards the very end of the affidavit. Paragraph 26. And Mr. Wielden uh, puts forward positive evidence to the effect that he's been able to do some internal soft stripping. He doesn't know to say, I don't know what this term means, or I'm not able to do any more because of lack of money or lack of a contract or anything of that kind. He, he tells the court without rider, uh, I've been able to do some soft stripping, and he attaches some photographs. And of course, the judge deals with this and says effectively it was only the threatened hearing or the threatened committal that prompted this action on the part of Mr. Wielder. So I, I, I do maintain that that is highly germane in terms of these grounds now advanced in conflict with the affidavit evidence that there was some shortcoming in the evidence or some shortcoming in the pleading. Um, it, it doesn't seem to be an issue that the judge was entitled to take the financial resources of Mr. Wielden into account, and they were considerable. One sees that in the judgment. Uh, we, we are here talking of six figure sums. So, sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Wale. Um, can I just the 12 photographs as referred to in paragraph 26 of the appellant's affidavit? Yes. What, are they in the bundle? And if they, so, they are in the bundle. Oh. They, they start at 357. Right. That there's a series of photographs that that follow thereafter. See, there's slightly more than 12. And they don't seem to show any soft stripping either, as well, far as I can see. My Lord, to, to answer that point, can, can I go to um, the judgment? <coughs> core, core bundle C57. Paragraph 18 on that page, and, and to put the point in context, of course the judge is also adverting to evidence uh, on behalf of the district council in terms of what had happened before the committal hearing, and the judge explains in that paragraph or makes certain findings as to what it is that had been done. The, the judge did describe it as, as very little by way of soft stripping, which may, which may explain my Lord's uh, uh, query, um, but um, that the judge did accept, and of course um, it, it not challenged by the District Council, that there have been some soft stripping done in advance of the hearing by Mr. Wielden. Whether his photographs show that it is in a sense rather beside the point. The fact is he did something. If, if the court is still in the core bundle, if we go over the page to C58, it's at the foot of the page, paragraph 25, where one sees the reference to the very limited soft stripping and, and the finding as to what it was that had motivated it, namely the pending hearing. And can we, um, with, with that evidence in mind, uh, and that case, if you like, of Mr. Weald in, in mind, uh, stay with the uh, judgment, uh, this time at page C56. And in paragraph 14, 
that the judge makes uh, the finding in favour of Mr. Wielden in, in, in relation to two of the uh, uh, alleged contempts, particulars four and five. He goes on to say at the end of that paragraph, however, there are three other particulars. Uh, and the judge records Malone and Friend's submission that, that that's not the case that Mr. Wielden had come to meet. And, and in short, um, the judge distinguished the in-player uh, case, but found it didn't apply, uh, and uh, rejected the submission in terms of uh, knowing the case he had come to meet. So that, that was all, um, that point at least, uh, was at least addressed in the court below. And th this is simply not a Sage and Hewlett Packard type case, the one about um, a, a fine of contempt in relation to a matter that had not been put. It's simply not, nothing to the point. Here, there were a number of particulars of contempt alleged. The judge found for the council on some, found against the council on others. But those particulars were fair and square before Mr. Wielden, uh, uh, and he knew it, he never asserted otherwise. And then, this rather shades into the, the pleading point, and my Lord asked Malone Friend uh, a very direct question. Uh, is there any authority to support the proposition that the uh, particulars have to plead ability to comply? And the very short answer is there is no such authority. Uh, n nor, uh, would I add, uh, is there any such requirement in Part 81.4 of the Civil Procedure Rule? As my Lord uh, reminded my own friend, the particulars plead contempt of court. There are various ingredients of contempt of court. Uh, one does not need to add. Um, the claimant had the requisite ability. And, and as I've said previously, he didn't put in issue his ability to comply with the uh, matters with which this court is concerned. Uh, and of course, the particulars of contempt, uh, I should recall them as my name is at the foot of them, uh, <coughs> particularises entirely separate and discrete particulars of contempt, uh, not limited to demolition and entirely reflecting the injunction order uh, settled back in November of 2018. So, in my submission, the pleading point uh, goes nowhere. Uh, no assertion of inability to comply with the relevant uh, particulars uh, and ample evidence, uh, not least from Mr. Wielden himself, to support the finding uh, that there was evidence um, that he had not complied and that he was able to comply. And the, the judge did not need to make, uh, in my submission, d discrete and particular findings as to the precise pounds, shillings, pence cost of removing some decking or matters of that kind uh, in circumstances where, uh, on the evidence and on the findings, uh, Mr. Wielden had tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds at his disposal. Can I just now deal with, I said there were one or two factual points. Um, can I just, two page references, forgive me, but the, the first is Core Bundle 96. This is within the O'Brien and Price report, and we've got on this page, at the top of it, some of the temporary steps in question, others are on the previous page, and one sees um, step number four, form temporary stone roadway up garden of Altea. Note uh, up garden of Altea. 
And then if we go to now the, the plan, or one of the plans that accompanied the report, this one is at page C119. And if we look at it uh, in landscape, uh, one sees the boundary wall or almost across the middle of the page. Uh, beneath that boundary wall, in simple terms, it, it is Altea. And one can see um, that that dashed line formed temporary hall road for access, which goes through the garden of Altea, pre precisely as described in the paragraph 4 that I just took the court to a moment ago. setting out the individual grounds of committal and, and not applying the criminal standard. Perhaps for good reason it's not been pursued orally and I, I rely on my skeleton argument as to that. Well, in that case, uh, just for completeness, can we go back to the Judgment. The court just bear with me one moment. Yes, I mean, I mean, I can find three references. So I'll, I'll start at C55. Paragraph 10, uh, where the judge correctly directs himself that uh, the burden is on the council and the standard of proof is the criminal standard. I, I mean, frankly, unsurprisingly, uh, these points were not in issue. Paragraph 12 records a submission by my learned friend, uh, again in terms of standard and burden of proof. One sees that in the second and third lines. And then if we go to uh, paragraph 19 and 20, In those paragraphs, uh, I have identified but no less than four occasions where the judge uses the term sure. Uh, paragraph 19, line 2. Paragraph 19, line 4. And then in paragraph 20, four lines up from the bottom, I am sure. Penultimate line, I am satisfied so as to be sure. And it's perfectly plain that what the judge did was went through the different particulars of contempt and, mindful of the burden of proof, applied the correct standard of proof to each of them. And, having done so, found in favour of Mr Wielden in some respects. Can we go back to the VW judgment now, please, in the authorities bundle? Paragraph 34. And we've got there those five propositions. In my submission, that there's no issue in relation to any of these. 
So the judge did identify precisely what the order required the defendant to do. Next, he determined whether or not the defendant had done it, done what was required, and whether or not it was within his power. In other words, was he able to do it? And indeed, Proposition 2, towards the end, poses that very question, not rhetorically, was he able to do it? And the judge made findings in relation to that. Third, the burden of proof. I've taken the court to the references to that. The judge was clearly well aware of where the burden lay. And he was entitled to take into account the counsel's evidence and the appellant's evidence to see if the burden was discharged. Little for the standard of proof being the criminal standard. I've dealt with that point. And then point five doesn't arise, really, I don't think. But the judge plainly and clearly did set out his findings in terms of failure and findings in terms of ability or non-ability. So in my submission, re-LW does not assist the appellant. Unless I can help further, can I move on to the second pair of grounds, grounds three and four? This begins with a debate, in this forum at least, in terms of the construction of the injunction order. And my learned friend, well, he doesn't resile from what I would describe as the ambitious submission that the order was not properly drawn, despite the fact that the point was not taken in this court on the previous application for permission. And we've covered the various timescales of the hearings in late 2018. And in my submission, it's far too late in the day to be taking points second time round in the Court of Appeal in terms of whether or not the order is, quote, properly drawn. In my short submission, it simply is. And as I say, it's too late to raise those kinds of arguments. Now, if we go back to the injunction order, then starting at core bundle page 40, and we start with the first paragraph of the order, one sees that the defendant, Mr. Wielden, had to do various things by the 25th of April 2020. That date exactly reflects the 18 months finding of the judge in November of 2018, or October of 2018. That's where the 18 months comes from. Now, there was one mandatory obligation by an entirely appropriate timescale. And then if we go over the page, we've got these other steps. And to take one example, paragraph 4, the soft stripping and the decommissioning. Compliance with this provision is not dependent on compliance with some anterior provision. Whilst it might have been envisaged that things would be done in a certain sequence, that they are nonetheless freestanding. And the best evidence for that, perhaps, is that Mr. Wielden himself, as we know, did some soft stripping. It did not depend upon compliance with steps 1, 2, or 3 beforehand. He never asserted anything to the contrary. So, in my submission, that really is the end of ground 3. And ground 4, which is still in terms of the injunction order, is this new assertion that the order in some way lacked precision. 
Again, a point not run in the previous attempted appeal, a point not taken in Mr. Wielden's affidavit, and, and the judge made certain findings as to this, which are not challenged, at least not expressly. And I, I give two paragraph references. Um, the, the first is in paragraph, or the, rather the first two are in paragraph 11 of the judgment below, where the judge finds that Mr. Wielden was aware of the O'Brien Price report and the enforcement notice and the references to them. <coughs> Uh, and there's another another finding in paragraph 11, quote, he does not allude to any difficulty in understanding its provisions. That's to say the provisions of the order. And then the, the next reference is paragraph 17, where the judge makes another finding, not expressly challenged, that the order is adequately clear. In other words, in other words it's sufficiently clear. That, that is directly dealing with the uh, precision point. And c can I deal with this uh, this other or, or another late running point? Um, that is to say the fact that the injunction order cross refers to the O'Brien and Price report and uh, the enforcement notice. The, 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 the simple point is that this point was not taken below. I, I think my own friend actually very fairly um, accepted as much when, when the point was put to him. And can I just make good that <coughs> by re returning again to the judgment? Uh, this time I'm at core bundle 55. And at paragraph 10, again, where the judge records that Malone Friend did take at least one preliminary point, uh, but not the one now being argued, that the point taken was that the report and the enforcement notice uh, were inadmissible as they hadn't been served with the application, that that point the judge dealt with and rejected. Uh, as I say, as really must be common ground, uh, n no point was taken in terms of the principle of cross referring to these uh, documents. Uh, no reference was made to Harris and Harris, as is also common ground. And in my submission, we, we don't need to go to the judgment in Harris and Harris, although I'm very content to do so if the court wants me to, but the, the context was very, very different indeed. H here, Mr. Harris was uh, the subject of, I think, six previous injunction orders, or it might have been five, and what he had to do, faced with this, uh, as the judge put it, jigsaw to be disentangled, was he had to try and uh, unravel all of these injunction orders, or study these six different injunction orders to work out the terms of the original injunction order uh, in circumstances where there was an application to vary or modify or add an injunction order. That, that's nothing to do with this case. We, we've got one injunction order. That's it. Adequately clear. No difficulties in understanding it. No Harris and Harris point taken. Mr. Wielden understood it. And I might add that if the court sees any merit in this point at all, it doesn't bear on paragraph 4 of the injunction order. That's the soft stripping decommissioning paragraph, which doesn't contain any cross reference. And before I move on, I'll just deal briefly with a point that was made in the sweep-up, so to speak, in the Renfrew submissions. Um, 
I am not seeking to reverse the burden of proof, but, but the real point is the judge didn't. The judge knew where the burden lay, and he correctly applied it, uh, just as he correctly applied the standard of proof. My lady, my lord, um, unless you have any further questions, I propose to move to the sentence grounds, grounds five and six which have rather narrowed, it seems to me, uh, in the course of this morning. Uh, the, the, the principle of suspending on terms plainly is not in issue and cannot be in issue. Um, what, what the judge below did, and we've now got the transcript of the sentencing aspect of the hearing, it's right at the end of the core bundle. Again, I don't think we need to go to it right now. But what, what the judge did was he uh, assessed the degree of culpability and harm on the part of Mr. Wielden. He, he looked at all the circumstances, including matters of mitigation, like credit for good character, um, and uh, arrived at his sanction, uh, which was a matter entirely for him. And this court may or may not have sentenced differently but it doesn't follow that the sentence is wrong. And really it seems to me, listening to my own friend, that where, where grounds five and six boil down to it is the proposition that um, if there is any shortcoming, which I don't accept, uh, it, it could be remedied by uh, attaching a liberty to apply provision to the sentence at once the 18 weeks compliance uh, have elapsed. But, but like my Lord, uh, uh, I would also uh, take the point that there is, I think it was described as an ongoing wrangle, um, which, which may be of some relevance. And at the end of the day, the injunction order still stands. The committal application was resolved, but the injunction order still stands. Uh, and in my submission, the uh, suspension of the sentence on terms uh, was entirely within the uh, gift of the court and, and, and cannot be said to be wrong. Uh, can, I, can I also mention this slight curious feature of the hearing below, in that having found Mr. Wielden in contempt in the two matters, both my learned friend and I, in fact, agree that the sentencing ought to be adjourned for 18 weeks. And, and despite our agreement, the judge rejected our mutual positions and said, for the reasons we gave, I'm going to proceed to sentence. Uh, but, but in my submission, in, in terms of this submission that 18 weeks is insufficient, which is the case being put, it is of some relevance that Malone Fend on behalf of his client actually agreed to 18 weeks as being the appropriate, if you like, time scale for um, carrying out the necessary uh, soft stripping <coughs> and decommissioning. Well, can, can, can I just see if there are any other points? Well, can I, I just ask you a question? Of course, please, my lady. Mr. Wild. I think Mr. O one of Mr. Old's points was um, there's, a, there's, as it were, a, a, a disjunction between the period within which the works needs to be done and the period for which the, suspend, the sentence was suspended. Yes. And um, do, do you want to say anything about that point specifically? Yes. Well, the, the, the judge obviously went through the, the, the correct chain of reasoning in the sense that the judge determined that the custody threshold had been satisfied uh, and then had to decide for himself, well, is it appropriate to suspend the sentence? And, and he came to the judgment that that was appropriate, but clearly on the basis of this condition. Now, I understand the point about the condition, but what I'm not clear about is why the judge decides to suspend the sentence for a longer period than 18 weeks. 
Well, I the, think that's the point Mr Rowley yes, making. Yes, well, the, the answer to that, or an answer to that, is the point I've just made, that one mustn't forget that the underlying injunction order is still extant. Well, where does that take us? Because the, the injunction order obviously is there in the fine of contempt to secure compliance, but is also there, at, uh, it has a deterrent effect as well. Yep. And I say that in, in circumstances where the injunction order is still extant, it, it, even if those works are done within 18 weeks, there is a, a justification for that period of suspension still to continue. Which is what? Because ju the judge has, the judge has held that. And look, I, I'm just not following that. I think it's my fault. The judge has held that the, the appellant couldn't comply with the whole of the injunction. So, if the point of suspending the sentence was to secure compliance with the bits that the judge thought the appellant could comply with, what's the justification for suspending the sentence for longer than 18 weeks? That's what I'm just trying to understand. Yes, as I say, it, it, I'm sure it's my fault, not my lady. The, 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 the point is that b because the injunction order still stands, Mr Wheelan is still obliged to do certain things. I mean, I'll say in open court, I've, I've no instructions to the effect that there'll be some fresh application, but that those obligations do still stand. And, and that, in my submission, is, is a, a, an explanation or a justification for the mismatch, so to speak, or the difference does between the... Just the, the judge explain, because I, I, I confess I hadn't, I hadn't appreciated that the sentencing remarks were in the bundle. I'd seen some correspondents complaining that they weren't. <laughs> I hadn't noticed that they were actually in the bundle. So um, does the judge actually explain his reasoning on this point? Okay, can I just double check? Mm. Um, can I, if it has been added to my lady's core bundle, it's, at the, it's the very last page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, did it? Because pages 123 to 125, yes. we've got the judge passing sentence. Yeah. Indeed. But did he give a separate judgment as well? well? Well, we had, originally in the bundle, we had the transcript of the findings of contempt. Yeah. But we didn't have the transcript of the sentencing, yeah. which, which we now have. Yeah. Just one, two, three, two, so it's not a, it's not a separate judgment, so to no. speak. It's the transcript. All right. And it, it, the the judge may not have given an explanation if my lady is looking for one. But it, it, the, if there is an answer, it's within B to E on that last page. I think it's fair to say that there's certainly no express explanation in those. Right. Well, that's just him just saying what the sentence is, isn't it? Yes, as I say, there, do, there doesn't appear to so be... So, so, in other words, there is no explanation from the judge? No, not, not that I can see on that. No, all right. All right. And what you're saying is that there notionally could be further applications to commit to enforce all of the... I, I, indeed, and as I say, I have no instructions. I don't want anyone to take the wrong thing no. from it, uh, if there is in due course an application, or, or to take from me that there won't be. I just simply make the point that that injunction <coughs> order, with its obligations, is still there. All right. As I say, can I just check to see if there are any other matters that I perhaps ought to deal with that, that I haven't? I don't think so. So unless I can assist any further, those are my submissions. Thank you very much, I'm Mr. Grateful. Yes, Mr. Old. Uh, <coughs> Lords, so there are just, um, I think, five brief points, if I can make them. The first is, uh, Melinda Friends made the point that there was no requirement to put into the uh, application notice the, um, the fact that the uh, defendant could comply or was, or was able to comply. Lords, I don't think that's right. The 
rule is um, CPR 81.42H. Uh, and it requires, it says, a contempt application must include statements of all of the following. <coughs> and H is a brief summary of the facts alleged to constitute the contempt set out numerically in chronological order. <coughs> So in my submission, one of the facts that constitutes the contempt <coughs> is that the appellant is able to comply, not merely that he has not done so. The second point I come to is uh, my learned friend spent a lot of time looking at uh, the appellant's affidavit. And in my submission, the, affidavit, the appellant's affidavit makes very clearly the point that I made earlier, which is that the appellant was taken by surprise. The appellant says, I resist, I can't rebuild the building for four main reasons. And he sets out his four main reasons. If he had known that the respondents had an alternative case, which was, if we can't get home on the main, then we'll get home on lesser matters, then he would have addressed those lesser matters. But as there was no indication that they were saying he was capable of doing less or how much less he was capable of doing, he didn't address those. And it's difficult to see. When one's left with a sort of value judgment by the judge, well, he was able to do this, but he wasn't able to do that. He did have enough money for this, but he didn't have enough money to do that. This was dependent on doing something else. Um, well, I mean, another inference that could be drawn is that um, he was setting out his case on what he couldn't do, and um, to the extent he didn't allege he couldn't do other things, um, he was accepting that he could. Well, milady, if he had been aware that that was being alleged against him, that might be clear. But to make that, when the, when the applicant has not set out that part of their case expressly, to say that because the um, appellant didn't respond to it, when it wasn't clear, would in my submission be a, a, a strange. Well, it's a bit circular, isn't it? Um, All right. Um, paragraph. What What does one make of paragraph twenty six of his affidavit, which um, says there's the twelve photographs paragraph showing the internal stripping, soft stripping that I have been able to effect. It um, rather suggests that he did think he was under an obligation to do soft stripping, and he doesn't say why he couldn't do more. No, my um, lord, two, two answers from that. One is it makes it patently clear that soft stripping is not a term of art, is not a term that's defined, and uh, what he's using is a completely different expression from that which um, the learned judge seemed to think soft stripping was. So it makes the ambiguity point uh, expressly clear. Um, he's using the term soft stripping because he's required to do something, and it's not surprising that a chartered accountant age 69 who is facing a potential imprisonment <coughs> does whatever he can uh, to try to avoid that. Um, and uh, he's used the expression soft stripping because that is the expression used in the order, but not because he's accepting that thereby there is a definition of soft stripping. So it, it, in my submission, it makes the appellant's case that soft stripping is not a clear expression. He's done what he can mm. uh, in, in the circumstances. Did, did the appellant give evidence at, at either of the two hearings? I thought I picked up that he didn't. When I He didn't give evidence at the committal hearing, but he did give evidence, as I understand it, at the 2018 hearing. He was a litigant in person, the lady there. I didn't represent him, but I think I might have said he did give evidence. So not at the committal hearing, but he did at the 2018 yeah. hearing. Yes, Melania Friend, who was present, confirms that is correct. Thank you. And um, was that his decision, or, or was it because the council didn't want to cross-examine him on his affidavit? Uh, it was his decision. So what was the status of his affidavit? Um, well, my lord, the, the learned judge accepted it, um, and he didn't um, draw any inferences uh, that he said. So he's accepted it, and indeed adopted it. Um, so it is the evidence of what it says. And, um, 
the, um, the, the third point goes on to the findings that the, the learned judge made. And it, 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 in my submission, with the greatest respect to the learned judge, simply by saying that you feel sure does not create a, a finding on the criminal basis. What is necessary is to set out the evidence that leads to that conclusion. And whilst Maloney Friend says it wasn't necessary for the learned judge to make a pound, shillings, and pence assessment, no, it wasn't on an individual basis. But if he was to find the uh, appellant guilty of contempt, he had to set out, he had to work out what the overall cost was. Because he was saying the appellant must do this. And he must therefore say, set out what that overall cost is in order to be satisfied that the appellant is able to pay it. But there is no evidence to show what the overall cost will be uh, in carrying that out. Uh, and therefore, there, were, there was one complete piece of evidence missing uh, uh, as far as that was concerned. Um, the fourth point is that I express concern that there is a, a, a clandestine reversal of the burden of proof here. They're, they're constantly saying, well, the defendant didn't, or the appellant didn't set out any case on this. He didn't advance any case on this. He didn't advance any case on whether the, the, the order was uh, unclear when he put in his appeal back in 2018. In my submission, that does not assist the respondents. The question is, on a matter of construction, objective construction, what does the order mean? And am I right when I say that the order uh, is not uh, clear uh, for the reasons that I've already set out? That is the question, not whether the um, appellant, when a litigant in person, raised it uh, before the, uh, in his application for permission. But equally, to say that because somebody has been refused permission to appeal on a, a general basis, that then makes the order inviolable, in my submission, must be wrong. There are often cases where an order is drawn and it appears to be clear on its face, and then later on it becomes apparent that there are difficulties in understanding it. And the difficulty that over arose here was that the appellant wasn't able to do clause one and the order wasn't clear what the status of clauses, particularly 3, 4, 5, were as a result when he could do neither clause 1 nor clause 2. And that is the weakness that arose. And that was clearly not uh, envisaged uh, back in 2018. The fifth point I make is that the Harrison Harris point is Harrison Harris, the facts of Harrison Harris were different, quite clearly. But the principle of Harrison Harris, referring back to the decision uh, of Lord Upjohn uh, in the bankruptcy case, are that it is wrong in principle to have an injunction order that adopts another document. And then to say that your non compliance is with the terms of that other document. When that other document is not crystal clear, but is a recommended document for discussion, uh, in my submission, the Harris point is no good. Those points should have been on the face of the 2018 order, just as they have been able to be put on the 2021 committal order. There was no reason for them not being there uh, at the beginning. There was this one final um, Point of detail. A learned friend took you to the plan on page C119. And he said, look, the road only goes to uh, before the wall is demolished. But the road, so in other words, the, the temporary road which comes in from the, the comes in, and it, it's on, depicted as stopping before you get to the demolished part of the wall. But of course, the road needs to get to the building. The point of demolishing the wall is to put it in there so it gets to the building. And so it's apparent that the wall does need to be demolished in order to complete the construction of the road. Or, if I'm wrong about that, it is not an ambiguous
explicitly clear that that is not the position. So, the Lord's putting those matters together. What I say is, the learned friend has not dealt with the difficulty of the ambiguity of the order. He has not dealt with uh, the fact that the case that was Mr. Wilden was found guilty of is not the case that he came to meet, and that that is a result of the way that the application was read. And for that reason, I say, it would be unjust and unfair to Mr. Wilden for these findings of contempt on these individual issues to remain outstanding. Lords, unless I can assist you further, those are my submissions. Thank you very much, Mr. Old. Um, that's very helpful. Um, well, thank you both for your very concise and helpful submissions, which have meant that we've been able to finish the hearing this morning. Um, we're very grateful for that. And I thank you again for coming in a little bit earlier than you might have been expecting to. That, that was also helpful. Um, we're going to reserve our judgment, and um, in the usual way, we will circulate um, drafts of our judgments for um, textual comments only, that is, typos and obvious factual errors if, if you detect any, um, but not for argument about the reasoning. Um, and we'd be very grateful if you can do your best to agree a draft order once you've got the draft judgments. And if you can't, um, we'll consider written submissions about the terms of the draft order. All right, is there anything either of you need to ask? There is, of course, one point, and that is yeah. the suspension of the order. Um, yes. There was an application for stay Yes. And Lord Justice being ordered an expedited hearing. Uh, yes. I, I don't know, I, haven't, I should have calculated this exactly, but if, if it were to be some weeks before the order were handed down, yeah. uh, there is a risk that the 18 weeks would expire. And so I don't know whether uh, Your Ladyship would, would uh, include a, an interim order staying the, um, uh, the application of the 18 weeks. The yes, order. I think uh, we'll just confer briefly about that. I mean, at the moment, we think we should be able to give our judgments before the period expires, but we'll indicate now that if something something unforeseen happens and we're not able to, um, we'll consider th this again and we'll make provision to, to deal with it. Would that be something, would we need to apply in writing? Um, yes, because yes, you'll, be you'll know, you'll be then able to apply to the court with the date when the current suspension expires and invite us to extend and that will trigger action. Lord, I'm grateful. Um, once again, thank, thank you both very much. All rise. All rise.